Okay, so we're going to get started. Thank you all for coming in person and for everyone on the webinar. For those on the webinar, I think there's probably about 30 people on the webinar, just so you all are in the room, know that. We have, it's a joint um, presentation today. So we have people in the room, people on the phone. It's going to be uh, just a couple minutes of introduction trying to get everyone in the same space about why we're here and what this series of webinars is about. Uh, and then we're going to move into the actual topic of the day, which is insurance and coverage reform. And Carrie will be doing the presentation for that, and she'll be talking for about 30 minutes, and then we're going to have 20 minutes of questions. So we're going to do in-the-room questions, and we're going to attempt to try to get people to be able to unmute themselves and talk on the phone, or at least type in questions in the questions box on the webinar. So we're going to, it might take, it might be a little bumpy. At the same time, Tiffany is going to be recording this webinar so that we can post it online and people can listen to it. Um, hopefully we'll get that up in the next couple of weeks. We actually have to build the web page for it, so it'll take a little, a little bit of time. But, but we are going to get started. So open spaces, this is something we have been doing for the past uh, six months or so since we started, the three of us started in these positions under Sue Grinnell. And this whole um, subject got started on when John came in and he wanted to make health systems transformation and innovation a priority for the department. He hired Sue to start working on that. She's been integral into getting the department involved in the SIM and Healthier Washington efforts and getting us to be a leader in health reform in the state. Once we got brought on, we were started to focus a lot internally and try to do some workforce development both with our agency staff and with our local health staff. Open spaces are one of the mechanisms that we're trying to do this. They're intended to be opportunities for all public health staff and our stakeholders to learn more about health reform and how it's affecting Washington State. And we have traditionally, in the, and the, the three that we've held have been about the Healthier Washington investments in the SIM testing grant, the State Innovation Model Testing Grant. And now we're changing that up a little bit. We, that is a, um, a small subject of what, or not a small subject, but a, a small um, sector of what health reform really is in Washington State. So we want to broaden everyone's view about all the different elements of the reform. The Affordable Care Act really was just a jumping off point for reform, and we're going to be seeing the effects of it for the next decade or two. And that's what we're going to talk about in the next, in the series of webinars that we're putting on. And so how we got here, again, is through the Healthier Washington. We just wanted to make sure that everyone had an overview of this. We did get funded for this grant. We got the announcement in December. Um, it was not as much as we had hoped to get. We had a submitted a, a proposal of $94.2 million and we got funded 64.9. So there have been some budget cuts made, but we are still moving forward with all of our investments. As you can see, we have strat the strategies to the left and the goals on the right. And the investments in the middle are how we're going to reach those goals. And we're going to be doing it through the strategies of healthy communities. And I have to remember them all. Integrated care and social support and the pay for value and have the state be a, a first mover in how we change the way we pay for care. And so looking beyond SIM, these are the different elements of reform that we're going to be focusing on on the series of webinars. And you'll hear a lot more about them as we move forward. We're going to be doing two a month, um, so it's quite ambitious, but they're every other week. And today's is about insurance and coverage reform, which might be pretty familiar for a lot of you. What Carrie is going to do, and I think she'll talk more about this, is try to give an overview of the elements in the Affordable Care Act related to this particular reform, but then also really talk about how implementation has been going in Washington, because this is something we know the most about right now. It's been the biggest topic of conversation, I think, around the Affordable Care Act. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Carrie. She's going to talk about the session objectives. So this is Carrie Comer. She's the Strategic Operations Lead for Health Systems Transformation and Innovation here at the State Department of Health. Thanks, Caitlin. So um, I'm just going to kind of jump in with just uh, give you an idea of what our objectives are for this session. Um, really, we want to talk about um, some of this will be review for you. So it's kind of an overview of just the kind of high topic um, high topics of insurance and coverage reform. Um, it's not meant to include everything. We did a lot of this through the ACA 101 through 103 sessions um, last year, but we just, um, now that we've been in it for a year, we want to just bring everybody back to the same page, make sure we're all on the same ground, and then um, kind of 
take a look at what that's actually looking like in Washington and what we're doing about it and what we can do about it moving forward. And so I kind of broke this up into two sections, one on insurance reform, kind of looking at the system itself and kind of those um, particular to the insurance industry, and then the others that are made to improve access to care or coverage. So I saw a hand raised for questions. We are going to hold questions to the end if possible, just so that um, the people on the webinar can also participate um, and we can make it through and have time for discussion at the end. So just starting with insurance reform. Um, so the law brought about some responsibilities, some changes, and opportunities across the system, uh, really just to improve um, the access to coverage, access to care, and better health outcomes for um, U.S. citizens. And I think this is really important that we focus on that. Um, and I'm going to just go through kind of the highlights, the individual mandate, new, the new coverage it brought, what that means for citizenship, and then um, the insurance marketplace. So just to, looking at the individual mandate, so um, this is very specific um, to the U.S. citizens. Um, if they do not get coverage, they may have to pay a fee or a penalty. And keep in mind, this started last year, 2014. So as people are filing their taxes this year, this is when they'll see this. Um, and it's not very painful this year. Looking at the um, chart we provided here, it's not that much money. It's as we go further into reform that there's a, a really high penalty for not getting um, covered. So I think this year will be interesting to see how many people accept the you know $95 penalty um, versus next year. And if they kind of want to see how that plays out, how many people get the penalty and how many people actually pay it. So um, we'll learn a lot about um, how this part of the system is moving just from that alone. And then there's the taxes. And so um, as I was saying, this is we'll see more about that. But really, um, I, we wanted to give you some information about the taxes versus the subsidies, because I think there's some confusion about that. And there's also opportunities. So we have tax credits that um, you can use to reduce the cost of your premiums throughout the year. So um, that's one way people are saving money. And the other is the um, subsidies, which um, this is how you actually lower the cost for your out-of-pocket expenses for care. So the deductibles, the co-insurance, and the co-pays. I think people um, often get these confused and they're not sure how to access them and um, really what they mean and those terms are not our typical healthcare terms. So I think it can be confusing. You guys following me here? I see some nodding. This is good. I hope this means this is a little bit of review. So then um, there's some new coverages that came, and a lot of this came from expansion. And so in one way we expanded was for young adults. Um, young adults up to age 26 didn't have to be in school anymore to be on their uh, parents' insurance. And this added a lot of new coverage and access to services that they weren't getting. And um, I'll let them focus their finances on other things um, and for a young group that maybe aren't as um, concerned about um, urgent care or their health in the same way that the rest of us are, this may not have been a priority. So it's a great way to get them access to preventive services really for the long haul. And the other is Medicaid expansion. And so um, like Washington, 29 states um, chose to expand Medicaid and this has been a very successful expansion. Um, in Washington, we have exceeded expectations in terms of how many people would um, qualify and actually enroll. We have um, certainly met um, beyond our expectations for 2018 even at this point on what that enrollment looks like. So I think we have more people covered than we ever thought. Um, keep rolling. I see another question. Is this something Not that we can help? Okay. Uh, I read an article this morning that on the federal level there's 9.5 million people that have or registered for health care, which is about a million short of their goal for February 15th. That's going to be tough to make. <laughs> That's good, good information. I think we have been hearing similar reports. Um, and I guess we'll find out more about what that is telling us about how it's going here moving forward. So um, this um, citizenship in the mandate has come up a couple of times um, in my the circles I'm in, just trying to understand where immigrants fit in and where the um, like uh, tribes fit into this. So I just wanted to give a picture. I think it's important to know 
Um, who really does qualify when we talk about citizenship? I, this is a really wordy slide because I really think it's worth taking this information back. I'm not going to read it to you, but really it's about um, uh, lawfully present immigrants actually can use um, the marketplace or the exchange to get access to the services and to coverage. And I think there's been confusion around that. So I, um, I would really look into this further if, if you have um, clients or your program is looking at how to uh, really direct people to the services that they're looking for. I would say the caveat to that is that five-year residency. This is important. Um, to be considering and where you set up your um, resources and support around this might be impacted by that. Um, additionally, the um, undocumented Im Im immigrants are exempt from the individual mandate. Um, that is not true for their children or dependents. They would still be eligible. Um, and some of these people will also still qualify for Medicaid, so it's important that we still put them through the system and you know, let the system to make that determination so we see where they land and then we see where the gaps are. I think it's important that we have the full picture of that. And then um, tribes are kind of looking at it um, a little differently. Uh, for, for a lot of reasons, they contract their services differently than we do. They are really kind of closer to that universal payer system than we are in a lot of ways. They have just integrated in a lot of other ways around special programs, um, which I think there's a lot we can learn from from that, but I think they have a grip on how to serve their community a little bit differently than we do when we're talking about um, a national community versus their national community. So um, they have a great resources, and at the end of this um, the presentation, I put some resources in here. Um, they have a guide for um, health reform implementation, and I think if you haven't visited it, it's a really great resource to get a sense of how they're looking at it and um, getting some tips on maybe some things that work in, um, for your work and your populations moving forward. So um, I just wanted to touch on insurance marketplaces. Um, these, and I think a lot of people know this already, this is kind of the first stop for folks to figure out how they qualify for um, coverage, whether you're going to get into a Medicaid plan or if you're going to get into an individual um, or small group insurance plan. Um, last year was a little bumpy, we recognize that. This year has gone a lot smoother. We're making some changes in the state on um, kind of that whole payment thing is being addressed on how people's payments are being applied correctly to their premiums. Um, I think that said, We've had a very successful implementation of our exchange compared to other states. Um, you know, I think our neighbors to the south, Oregon, went through a, a pretty troubling time with theirs and now are you getting help from the feds. That doesn't say others won't do that or we don't move that direction eventually looking at what some of those options are, but we've had a great success. Um, but I think the exchange appeals to a lot of people that just aren't getting coverage through our employers. I, I know in my circles I'm hearing more and more about people that are getting jobs through temp agencies, for example, that aren't getting um, health insurance benefits, even if they're working for a company that provides them. So this is another challenge we're looking at. How do you look at the workforce and what their needs are that might not be fitting into our populations? That is just something else to consider. And I think the most important part of the um, marketplaces is the um, shopping and comparing apples to apples. This idea of, you know, you know what you're getting. You know that there's um, the benefits should be the same across all plans based on these metal levels. So we're just gonna first talk about um, kind of the different types of um, exchanges. I'm not going to go into this deeply, but. There's a federally ran um, exchange, there's the state-based, and then there's a um, partnership-based. Washington is state-based, and I had mentioned that um, Oregon is um, a federally run, now a federally run exchange. Really, it's um, states got to choose what their uh, approach to this would be, and some of them have started one direction and gone the other, and Oregon's a good example of that. But I want to just talk about the metal plans, and I think it's important to understand the significance of this when we're talking about comparing benefits across plans. Um, many of you have heard this term, um, essential health benefits. And we're going to be jumping into that and then when we go over coverage. But really the metal levels are to represent what percentage of those essential health benefits will be covered by your insurance plan. And so Another way we'd be looking at that is how much are you going to have to pay? So in this um, slide, if a bronze level is paying 60%, that means the consumer needs to be willing to fork out 40% for all the care they're going to receive. Um, 
Now, the premiums are real low, and that is really appealing, but it doesn't necessarily mean um, if you have a, um, some kind of condition you're trying to treat that you're really being able to afford the care moving forward. So I think the other, um, a couple other notes about the metal plans is that the silver plan is um, a little more costly, but it's where you get, you're eligible for the um, tax subsidies on um, the out-of-pocket costs for the assistance for um, deductibles, co-pays, and co-insurance in Washington. And this year is the first time Washington has offered a, a platinum level plan. Um, so we are, you know, kind of expanding our opportunities to get more coverage, but it is, it is a lot more expensive. But if you're in a kind of a, um, a high cost uh, treatment plan, that might be a better, better plan for you. How we doing? Am I speeding through? Or are we okay? I know those of you on the webinar, I can't see any nods or anything. Maybe I could get a, um, We're good. okay, good, great. So I'm gonna pop into coverage reform. So again, this is really gonna be the high level too. I, I hope this isn't too high, but just kind of shuffling through, I'm probably going. So really, um, Really, the coverage reform is related to the benefits um, and, and really hand in hand with the services you, you receive when you go to the doctor or your health care provider. And so to kind of get to that, we're going to focus on the more coverage you're getting under the, um, the reforms through this particular uh, benefit, the essential health benefits. Um, some of the additional uh, coverage that are being offered by plans that they don't uh, are requirements under essential health benefits. Um, and then uh, we're going to talk about preventive services or that category called free care. So just thinking about more coverage, um, what I'm meaning by that is that we have eliminated uh, pr the pre-existing conditions, um, restrictions, and we've also um, eliminated in most cases the annual or lifetime limits on services. Um, I could say I've still heard of some reports of those limits still being in place. This, is, this particular um, topic is challenging because of that grandfather status we've talked about before, which are those plans that ha aren't required to implement the, um, the rules around the essential health benefits and the preventive services. So um, really, there's criteria that sets them up that they get to keep um, the status, the, the services and benefits that they have um, until they've made a significant change, or I think it's until 2018. I think we've, it's 2016. Well, that's really close. Um, I, I think there's a couple of different approaches they have to how they're gonna be having to implement the um, essential health benefits. But this one in particular has been a challenge. Um, we've heard of many essential health benefits that get um, limitations around how many visits or their frequency, and that's really not the intent of the law. So let's take a look at the essential health benefits. As part of the ACA, health plans had to um, offer a set of essential services, and they came up with these 10 categories that they determined essential to healthcare, uh, to better health outcomes, I should say, and improved health. Um, this probably isn't new to anybody, but really, the, um, all the qualified health plans that, per, that operate in the exchange are required to uh, provide these set of services. And all of these things we talked about, uh, um, more coverage with the lack of the elimination of pre-existing uh, uh, pre condition and limits on um, services, they, they must follow those same guidelines. So some of the things that um, kind of fall outside of clear instruction in the essential health benefits are services like um, birth control, um, breastfeeding, and dental coverage. They're kind of sprinkled throughout health plans, but there's really not a specific recommendation for those services that everyone's following exactly. And um, we see health plans offering that as kind of a perk in the uh, marketplace or health plan finder so that they, so the people that are really interested in these benefits understand that they have access to them. The, the challenge to that is they're really not being in, implemented and interpreted the same across plans. Um, this is true for a number of services, but these ones have really stood out in terms of how people can really make a good decision about what kind of coverage they're getting. Let's talk about this free care. So I, I think one of the promises people really look forward to in, with the Affordable Care Act is this idea of free preventive care. I don't think anyone expected that it would be so hard to get it in certain settings. I think we've learned a lot about um, 
be really being able to identify what preventive services are, who provides those service of, services, and what that means. The uh, these preventive guide uh, free care for preventive services applies to plans that either became effective on or or after uh, March twenty third, twenty ten. That is actually a large uh, part of our insurance market in reality. I think that the majority of the plans that really are impacted by this um, ruling are um, ERISA plans or um, big, large employer plans, basically, um, and some of the um, union-based plans. They're still kind of hanging out there. Their benefits have traditionally been um, at this level already. They're also, like many of them are also looking at making sure that they're following these guidelines, but there isn't a requirement right now to do that. So I think that the other part about preventive services is that these services are supposed to be provided. Uh, we talk about um, cost share, like this out-of-pocket cost, but being able to access them um, without having to pay towards your deductible or out, without having that coinsurance or um, that copay. This was supposed to be an appeal to people to come and get into preventive care, really get some screenings done, get the counseling they need, um, kind of get ahead of the game, wherever you are in your age group or in your health status, being able to have access to that. Um, I'll go ahead and move the next one. Really, the, um, the, the structure of that was really, the preventive services were based around <clears throat> four categories of care. Um, and really around screening, counseling, routine immunizations, I bet this is sounding very familiar to us, um, preventive services for children and youth, and then preventive services for women. Now, um, these resonate well with us in public health because this is what a lot of our work is um, about and we uh, apply a lot of our resources and support for this. So of course we would wanna have a hand in the game. That said, um, these particular recommendations are made by different bodies and they're listed here before uh, below here um, USPSTF um, the United States Preventive Services Task Force um, was developed particularly to implement the preventive services under ACA so this wasn't a body that had existed prior this was something that came together for the implementation of the essential health benefits so um, I think that's something important to know moving forward I also wanted to just share information with you about how to get how to access this free care. I don't think a lot of people know some of the criteria or conditions that you would need to follow to get the free care. Um, I hear reports regularly that um, providers aren't getting reimbursed for um, a service that they provide that's deemed preventive in terms of the USPSTF recommendation, but and, and clients as well that are being asked to be pay, to pay but it's really because they didn't understand the criteria to receive the services. So really, to get the free care, it's not a surprise that the service has to be provided by an in-network provider, but what might be surprising and, and somewhat troubling is that the service would have to be an independent service specifically for that uh, preventive service. So if you're there just as a regular consult or your checkup and you decide to get the flu shot, that flu shot wouldn't necessarily apply to your preventive benefit. So I think these are some things that we need to shore up and at least make awareness around um, how to talk to your provider about getting that processed in a way or your, your uh, visit recorded and documented in a way that you're really getting what you came for and the promises being met around preventive services. So I'm just gonna spend a minute on um, essential community providers. Um, all of us in this room work with them in some capacity. Um, all of our local health departments are essential um, community providers based on the non-exhaustive list on the CMS website. Um, these providers serve the um, low-income or, or predominantly underserved populations. Um, sounds awfully familiar for us. And all of the health plans, um, qualified health plans, are required to um, have a, a set ratio or number of um, essential health providers in their network. Um, what that means in Washington is there's kind of a range around 30%. Health plans can kind of get out of it depending on where they're at and what they're, they have an opportunity to write a letter and explain why we've attempted, their, the idea is if they've attempted to build their network and they weren't successful, um, then there's some exceptions to that. So, so I think those are some things that we can look at as well in and, and terms of what public health can do to build up our, um, our resources and our network around supporting this. 
And then just to, just to talk specifically about networks, I wanted to share a little bit about what the network status means. And so we hear this term in network, um, and really kind of the, the fuss about that is when you're in network, you typically get a higher reimbursement if you're a provider. Um, you're, uh, a lot of health plans look at those providers and determine them eligible for their health plan uh, based on some quality measures through their credentialing process. So if you're a consumer and that provider's in network, you know that the health plan has determined them kind of qualified to work with the, with their population. So that's another um, kind of quality measure that health plans would say they put in place around this. Um, also, there's a um, providers accept a particular rate for the services that they're um, providing for their members in the health plan. So there's a lot of knowns about the cost of care and the quality of care from a health plan's perspective about that in-network status. Being out of network, which I think we're hearing more about this, certainly through um, our public health providers, is it doesn't mean you're not going to get paid for the service. It means you, it's it's a risk. You may not get paid. You may not get paid as much, and um, you would have to collect the rest of that from a patient. Um, this is a little different than in the in network. You wouldn't be able to get that full amount from the patient. You're stuck to the coinsurance or whatever that cost share amount is that the per that you have made an agreement with the plan. But this would be then you kind of chasing your patients to get the remainder of that amount. So I think there's some concerns there, um, and then. Another kind of tricky concept here is this the PCP piece in terms of in-network and out-of-network. Um, even if you're an in-network provider um, and you're providing a preventive service, what we've been hearing is if you're not the PCP for that service or that type of service, you may not be eligible to get the um, same reimbursement for that service, and it may not be qualified as a preventive service because you're not the PCP. So these are some things that we've raised, some questions we've raised around kind of that, what that status means and what that means for our um, communities, consumers, and our partners moving forward. So th that said, I'll talk a little bit more about kind of what the implementation has looked like. Like I mentioned before, more people are covered in Washington is that, and that is, you know, outstanding. We're still not sure that we have the capacity. Um, we're looking at, there's been a lot of talk about mid-level providers, what that looks like, how do we start moving um, to get more people into care and keep them in care, what that looks like. Um, that I think that there's a lot to be learned there still. Um, we also have... Um, the new payment and delivery models that are focusing on outcomes and whole person health. I think this is a big opportunity for us to take a look at how we're delivering services and how we're contributing to that here within the Department of Health and then without in the system, um, throughout the system. And then um, how we have, have seen different sectors coming together to really make this work. I think these are just really um, tremendous opportunities for us moving forward. And people have really um, taken advantage of being brought to the table at times when they haven't before. So I would say those were some of the greater highlights of um, the implementation. Some other things that we've noticed is that, um, you know, not everybody knows how to use their insurance. We've spent a lot of time talking about insurance terminology and really how to get insurance, what coverage means, not necessarily how to use insurance or how to um, work with your healthcare providers to understand how to, you make, how to use your insurance to make you healthier. So I think we have a ways to go around that. Um, and I'm not going to read all of these, but some other are that um, the coverage and benefits aren't clear for everybody. They're not clear for us here at the Department of Health. We have lots of questions. They're not clear for um, our partners, the local health. They have questions, and they're certainly not clear for consumers. I can say, truthfully, I do a lot of this work. I know a lot about insurance and benefits, and there's a lot I don't know about this. I. I regularly in my personal life get things that I can't figure out based on an explanation of benefits or how a benefit is determined. Um, and so I think there's just a lot of room for improvement around how we help people understand what it means. And that we're, while we might be shopping and comparing apples to apples, there's still a long ways to go in terms of how people really understand how to make the insurance work for them. And, and some of that is due to the um, interpretation and implementation variances across the plans. 
So some of the things we're doing about it here at the state level, um, our team and, and health systems transformation and, and innovation, as we are holding um, sessions like these open spaces, um, where people get to come and hear about some um, some topics and information and have discussion, ask questions, and that helps us understand where some gaps are too that we can spend more time on. Um, really providing more information and learning more about to share with others. We've been doing a lot of presentations. Um, some of those are customized for DOH staff or partners. We've been going to um, a lot of um, different offices and programs and providing either um, just getting, letting them see where they fit in or, um, or giving them some kind of strategic uh, place to talk about where they, how they move forward in this work. Um, and then we provide a lot of technical assistance internally and externally, um, trying to figure out who to hook up with who, where the gaps are, where the problems are, and then how to how to get um, a path to the right solution. Um, and some of the ways we've been doing this is through um, the issue tracking and issue management throughout the system. A lot of this is um, started internally with programs and staff, but we get a lot of um, responses and um, reports from local health that help us see what's happening on the ground. And so we've been managing it that way. Um, we have a, the SharePoint tool that we currently use internally that we're about to launch externally for LHJ. So those of you on the phone, I, I hope you're excited about this so you'll get a chance to um, get involved in that work more. We've created some really great partnerships um, with um, Healthcare Authority and the Insurance Commissioner's Office. And we've um, also de, uh, worked with and developed Sue and um, Laura Zeichgen at HCA, really put, brought together a group acro uh, across multiple agencies to look at health policy um, and, and what those impacts might be for us moving forward. They have these guidelines in mind. And, and I'll use this example, you guys, um, you know, the, I think this screen says a lot about what's going on. But one example I bring up a lot is that we have a pl health plan in Washington that interpreted the HIV screening as a once in a lifetime benefit. Um, and that's how you'll get it free. You'll get it free once in a lifetime and other than that, it's not considered preventive. These are the type of things we want to eliminate from interpretation across the plans. And so um, for us, this, that, that's a real barrier for moving forward in our work. So right now we're putting together a table of the um, uh, preventive services and we're, we're focusing primarily on, on preventive services because the USPSTF recommendations um, give the A or B grading that means that those should be considered free. No deductible, no cost, uh, co-pay co or co-insurance related to those services. So how do we make sure those services are being delivered in a way that, um, that people aren't having to pay for them? Um, and they are intended to actually reach the health outcomes that we're looking for. So some of you will be getting tapped to help populate this table on the guidelines we're using through Department of Health to deliver these services in a meaningful way. So this project is just kicking off. Kathy Lofi is really kind of sponsoring this with us and helping us get it going. We're working with Dan Lesler also at the Healthcare Authority to really get this moving. Our goal is to have some type of skeleton in place before the April 3rd deadline for filing this year, so plans by next year will have to implement these changes. So um, again, this is one approach. It may not be the end all be all, but this is one way we're looking at trying to really um, standardize the uh, preventive services. And so just some ways of, I kind of pulled out some ways that we are involved or you can get involved. Lots of our local health departments are still in person assisters or providing those services. And many of them still provide services or are assuring access to services across the system. Um, we are, um, in addition, they're participating along with a lot of other community-based organizations and other health organizations across the state in um, collaborative approaches um, to to advancing health reform in Washington, and I think that's a SIM or the Healthier Washington is just one example of that. Um, and then we we here at DOH, I think it's our still our responsibility to provide this, the support, the technical assistance, and the guidance that is needed throughout the system to really make this successful. And it might look different in different sectors. But I think um, having a real understanding of that being a, our responsibility moving forward and how we contribute ourselves to this transformation is really important. Uh, so we're at noon, and I don't want to go over, especially for those online. So I think we're going to end it. If anybody in the room has any other questions, we can hang out. And then 
anybody uh, on the phone, please just email us, call us, uh, anything like that. We're welcome, happy to help you as you need. So please let us know. All right, we have a listserv, which you all will be getting a survey about, so you can come join our distribution list. Thank you.